Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, great to have you join us. And as we uh, study uh, minor prophets with a major voice, um, today we're going to be looking at uh, the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk. So uh, Habakkuk is one of those uh, smaller uh, books that's found toward the end of the Old Testament. And, uh, but it does contain a significant message uh, as we live out our faith in Christ. So before I begin, why don't I offer up a prayer uh, just to set our hearts in the right place. Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you for the message of Habakkuk as we come before your throne and as we open up your word. Certainly, Casper uh, Schwenkfeld taught that uh, we cannot study your word without the Holy Spirit. And so we ask uh, you to illuminate our minds and hearts and help us to understand these things. Bless our time together in your word, and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So when you think about a prophet, uh, a prophet, of course, uh, I think sometimes people think of prophets are, are simply those who can forecast the future. But an Old Testament prophet had a a larger job in that he or she was considered a spokesperson for God, that they communicated God's message. And they oftentimes called the people of God back to covenant faithfulness and living according to God's laws and worshiping God as he is outlined in the Bible. Um, but the Hebrew term for prophet is navi. Um, and so uh, the Hebrew Bible is uh, divided up into three sections, the law, uh, the prophets, and the writings. Uh, and so the Navi, or the prophets, uh, consisted of uh, books like Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel would be considered the major prophets because of the volume of their material. And the, uh, the minor prophets, of course, would be like uh, people like uh, Nahum or Habakkuk or Zephaniah and, uh, and other shorter books. Um, but a prophet was considered to be both a speaker. He spoke things that he received directly from God and um, a uh, seer. He saw things uh, that other people did not see. Uh, you say, well, what are some examples of that? If you read in the early chapters of Isaiah, for instance, and Isaiah saw the Lord in his temple, high and lifted up, and thousands upon thousands angels uh, cried out, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So prophets saw things that other people did not see. And then um, prophets also said things uh, that other people did not hear or receive. And so um, <clears throat> they were able to differentiate between um, the message of their heart and the message that God was trying to communicate. And this, is, this would be a, a burning message that they, they could not contain. Um, so... Notice what, uh, for instance, Jeremiah 23, verse 16 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. So there were some false prophets uh, operating in Jeremiah's day that uh, spoke their own message, and not the message of God. And uh, Ezekiel 13, verse 2, also lends itself to this. And uh, Ezekiel 13, verse 2 says, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who are prophesying, and say to those who prophesy from their own hearts, hear the word of the Lord. So back in Old Testament times, if one was proven to be a false prophet, uh, he was to be stoned to death. Um, so God communicated with his people 
and gave them messages directly from him. And uh, God was very well aware of the false prophets uh, in biblical times. Now, you say, well, who are some other prophets? Uh, we know the biblical books that are named after those prophets that, uh, that ministered uh, to the people of Israel. Um, but uh, the office of prophet goes clear back to the time of Moses. So you're talking about um, uh, 1500 B.C. So um, uh, Moses was the first prophet. He received the Ten Commandments from God on, on stone tablets. He received the message from God to go to Pharaoh and, and to say, um, let my people go. Uh, so Moses was the very first prophet. And then the very last prophet would be, of course, John the Baptist. Uh, so he was the one that prepared the way of the Lord, as he's spoken of in the book of Isaiah. So he would be the last prophet in a long line of prophets that are throughout the Old Testament. Now, uh, a prophet had a direct line of communication with God. He uh, received messages from him, and uh, they uh, were like a burning message that they, they had to get out. Uh, so God used these men and women to communicate his message. Also, it's important to know that in Old Testament times, before the gift of the Holy Spirit, of course, what we celebrate Pentecost for, uh, the Old Testament, uh, in the Old Testament, only uh, the Holy Spirit only uh, resided upon or worked through prophets, priests, and kings. So, of course, a prophet would speak on behalf of God. Uh, um, a priest would minister between the people and God. And then, of course, kings had to lead the people of God uh, politically and uh, uh, engaging with other nations and uh, governing the land. And so only prophets, priests, and kings had the Holy Spirit. So it gives you an idea of what the source of their messages were. Now, as we continue, who was this strange cat named Habakkuk? Okay, here, here are a couple of pictures that might give you a time frame of when Habakkuk uh, ministered. So he ministered um, at the close of the uh, 600s, right at the beginning of uh, the 6th century, the close of the 7th century. So um, if you look down there, uh, right before um, Judah, the southern kingdom, is to go into uh, exile. There was a united kingdom under Solomon's reign from basically 950 BC until about 750 BC. And then uh, the kingdoms uh, were uh, divided. Uh, Israel was to the north, Judah was to the south. And uh, Israel was carted off into exile in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians. And then Judah was left alone. Um, and Judah was defeated by the Babylonians and carted off into exile in 586 B.C. And the reason that that's significant is um, the, the people of God had turned their back on the Lord and that they were following uh, the way that they wanted to live instead of living out their faith in, in God uh, who had uh, delivered them from the Egyptians, who had provided for them in the wilderness, who had uh, given them uh, kings such as Saul and David and Solomon, and had uh, uh, given them peace with their uh, adversaries, and uh, had fed them, um, and the list could go on and on of the many blessings that God gave his people in the Old Testament. But time and time again, uh, they turned their back on God and lived the way that they wanted to live. And so um, Habakkuk ministered at a crucial time, and the years are 600 to 605 B.C., just a few years before, God would then send the Babylonians to uh, defeat uh, Jerusalem 
and cart off God's people into exile. So uh, that gives you a time frame. Um, so right after Isaiah uh, ministers and right during Jeremiah or right be before Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel minister are the prophets Nahum, Zephaniah, and Habakkuk. But Habakkuk is at the close of the 7th century BC or 600 to 605 BC. So, who is Habakkuk? Well, his name is uh, maybe a little bit difficult to uh, pronounce, but it's uh, even more difficult to interpret. In the Old Testament, uh, everybody's name meant something. Well, we're really not sure how to interpret Habakkuk's name. Um, he ministered at a difficult time in Judah's history uh, after uh, Josiah uh, lost his uh, reign in 609 BC, and Josiah brought many reforms. And for a short time, people turned back to God, but it wasn't any time at all before they reverted back to their own ways. Um, and this was during Jehoiakim's reign, and Jehoiakim was not a good king. Uh, the Babylonians were coming on the scene as a major power, uh, and they defeated the Egyptians, who were the uh, incumbent uh, power at the time. And there was a huge battle called the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC of which uh, the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians, and so they became the world's superpower at the time, and they were under the king Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be famous uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, of course, was the king that uh, wanted um, um, Daniel, uh, Daniel's friend Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to to bow down to the golden statue of which they were then tossed into the fiery furnace. So we know that Nebuchadnezzar was a cruel king and uh, believed himself to be godlike. Um, we also know that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was um, a, a very arrogant king. If you read about his statement in uh, Daniel chapter 4, he thought that his kingdom was uh, given to him as a result of all of his power and glory. And God drove him insane and uh, uh, made him a spectacle. You can read about that in Daniel chapter 4. Um, Habakkuk dealt with the moral and spiritual deterioration of God's people. Um, so as the people turned to other gods, as they participated in sexual immorality, as they worshipped uh, foreign gods on the high places, uh, God began to be impatient with them, and he warned them repeatedly. And he's going to warn them through the prophet Habakkuk. Again, a classic uh, a job description of the prophet was to call the people back uh, to faithfulness uh, to God. And... Um, Habakkuk was unsuccessful in that because the uh, Babylonians eventually came and laid siege to Jerusalem in 586 BC and conquered God's people. And so what you have throughout the book of Habakkuk is persistent prayers under prophetic distress over the impending doom of a pagan superpower. So that's kind of a mouthful, but um, again, God's warning his people, hey, if you don't get right, I'm going to raise up a foreign power to come and defeat you. So if you want to live in peace and experience the blessings, you have to get your act in order, act in line. And so that's uh, a little bit about Habakkuk. Now, the Babylonians. Um, they are spoken of uh, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 6. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. So uh, the Babylonians were considered to be a cruel group. 
and they ruled with an iron fist. Incidentally, uh, Saddam Hussein, when he was in power, he had stated that uh, he wanted a modern day Iraq to be the second coming of the Babylonians. And he considered himself to be uh, a king uh, following the line of Nebuchadnezzar. So that's a little bit of modern translation of how um, powerful or how glorious the Babylonians were that Saddam Hussein made, made that his goal. Uh, the Babylonians first invaded Palestine in 605 BC, and we read of that in Daniel 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. <clears throat> and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar to the house of his God and place the vessels in the treasury of his God. So that's, that was the ultimate example of conquering a people was to take their articles of religion, their artifacts and place them in the temple of uh, the victorious uh, King's uh, God. So, um, you know, that, that's a symbol of um, the Babylonians taking over or defeating the Israelites at the time. So, uh, they fought and defeated the Egyptians shortly before uh, they conquered Jerusalem in 605. It established them as a superpower. Habakkuk's prophecy seemed to be unbelievable to his audience, and that's, uh, you know, um, that's how uh, God is. God oftentimes is calling people to wake up, and in the Old Testament, he cer certainly pronounces doom and judgment, but the people, they wouldn't listen, and they, uh, they didn't believe God's spokesperson. And uh, without drawing too many parallels to today, you know, how many of us would have uh, believed that we would be in the present-day predicament six months ago? Um, you know, we didn't, we've, ne we've never heard of the coronavirus, and uh, we've lived through other viruses such as SARS and, um, and uh, the avian flu, and we survived that. And so, oh, our country's not going to be shut down. Uh, there's no way that uh, um, unemployment rate could be 20% in the state of Pennsylvania. But here we are, and um, so it seems to be uh, a scenario that was once unbelievable, uh, but today is reality. Now, I, I don't know is that this is uh, uh, necessarily uh, a sign of doom from God, but what I do know is that God being sovereign, he is using the, the present situation to get people's attention. Um, Tony Evans, who's a very popular pastor in the Fort Worth area, Dallas-Fort Worth, he, uh, he says that uh, there are signs that uh, uh, people are uh, experiencing a spiritual awakening in America because of the coronavirus containment. And I, and I agree. I, I think that people are um, ripe for the message of the gospel. And so as a church, we need to be sensitive to that. And um, so Habakkuk lived in the dark days of Judah. God's law was no longer the standard of right and wrong, as Robert Chisholm says in his uh, uh, commentary. Uh, and, and today, that's the way that it is. Um, you know, you think about the Ten Commandments. Uh, and is our country living with the Ten Commandments as uh, the influencer of our consciences. Um, as a nation, um, no. You know, there's uh, a lot going on in our nation that would indicate that uh, we are far from God and we are in need of spiritual revival. So um, um, be that as it may. Um, but what does Habakkuk teach us about God? 
Well, I would say many things. Um, first of all, it teaches us that God is a sovereign king. In other words, God rules and reigns in a perfect way. So if we take a look at Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 6 and 10, notice what it says. Describing God, he stood and measured the earth. He looked back and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered and the everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. And then verse 10, the mountains saw you and writhed. The raging water swept on. The deep gave forth its voice and it lifted its hands on high. So uh, this depicts God as the one who rules over his creation. And uh, who else can shake the nations? Uh, no one, uh, only God. And so God is seen as a sovereign king. He's also seen as a mighty warrior. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 4. His brightness was like the light rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. And verse 8, Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers, or your, indigna your indignation against the sea, when you rode upon your horses on your chariot of salvation? And then verse 15, You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. So uh, this is the picture of God being a mighty warrior and conquering his enemies. Um, and that God is also a just judge. So we can go and review those verses. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 13, You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Um, also in chapter 2, verse 8. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. I believe that God is speaking to the Babylonians at this point. Um, and then verses 15 through 17. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. Again, he's speaking to the Babylonians. So the point of it is, is that God is the standard of truth, and he, know, he declares, he defines right from wrong, and he will hold people accountable. He's going to hold Judah accountable for turning their back on God, and he's going to hold the Babylonians accountable for their sin and for their ruthlessness, even though he's going to use the Babylonians to judge his own people. So, what is the major lesson in the book of Habakkuk? Oh, and I left out that uh, um, uh, Habakkuk al also teaches that God is the ultimate protector of Israel. Just as uh, Jehoiakim uh, may have uh, tried to uh, sign alliances with other nations in order to ensure their protection, what he should have done is go to the Lord and seek his protection of the people. And so God is the ultimate protector of his people, and we know that to be true in our lives, is that any blessing that we have comes directly from God. Habakkuk 3, 18 and 19, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like deer's. He makes me tread on high places. So God is the protector of his people. And so 
um, basic to this whole discussion um, of uh, Habakkuk is God using a foreign nation to judge his people. And that's how he used the Babylonians. He raised them up. He brought them into Jerusalem. They laid siege to it. They carted off the people of God into exile. And he did this um, to prove that uh, um, he is their judge. And if they turn their back on him, he's, uh, they're going to suffer greatly for that. So how, what does that have to do with our faith, one might ask? Well, Habakkuk also has a message that when things don't go right, we must trust God and have faith. When we can't see what he's doing, or nor can we understand what's happening around us, we must trust God no matter what. And let me just ask you, how do you think that applies to the here and now? Um, Habakkuk's message uh, found in chapter 2, verse 4, the just shall live by faith. So, uh, and that means that, of course, even though our outward circumstances are not what we want, they're not what we're pleased with, uh, we want things to be differently, and yet God wants us to trust him and to walk by faith. How do you think that translates into today? Do you think, one, do you think that's challenging? Two, do you think that's applicable to the here and now? What do you think? Well, the obvious, I guess, implication would suggest then that uh, perhaps the, what we're in right now with this pandemic is to get our attention, just yeah. as the Babylonians were sent to get their attention. Yeah. I think as we go through each day, um, basically the same in the same circumstance, um, without really knowing when an end in sight will be back to our former way of life, it's almost easier to trust God because you're getting a whole lot of practice. <laughs> you know, I know for me, sometimes it's, you know, throughout the day or some days are better than others. Um, but then I just remind myself that, you know, God has, has all of this in his control. Mm. And the more that I'm reminded, the quicker it comes to mind as the first thought rather than the last thought. Yeah, I, I agree both uh, with Jim and with Janet. I think that uh, it is getting our attention, um, and that's a good thing. It reminds us of what is really precious and valuable. And, and then two... Yeah, Janet, we're getting a lot of practice in trusting God, aren't we? Um, we're reminded that, hey, it's, uh, it's not about us, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's about the Lord, and, and uh, we don't know when this is going to happen. We discussed at a leaders meeting today, Steve Desiri, was, uh, he attended a kind of a, um, a, a meeting with other people that were in charge of safety at their congregations and uh, um, met with Val Arkush, who is, uh, you know, a, a representative in the county. And they're thinking that really we shouldn't um, expect to meet as, as, as a congregation until sometime in July. Um, I, there was a time when we thought, okay, maybe at the end of May uh, we can have an outdoor service and a and and maybe do a picnic or maybe not. But now it looks like that really uh, it's going to be July. And I've heard that colleges are also thinking about well, what are we going to do for the fall. I've heard the California colleges are thinking about doing online classes through the fall. So. Yeah, I think that one of the things, and this is contrasting putting faith in the in God, is that you see that um, if you listen to the man, you know, every day you've got a different story, a different reality, a different new cure, and you see sensationalism and uh, you know just basically contentless news. 
and you can go chasing chasing your tail trying to understand what's going on and and know nothing whereas the same type of thing when you talk about and you, i don't think you went into what what uh when habakkuk was questioning god a lot of times we take the approach of well i don't understand it therefore god must be wrong as opposed to we just don't understand his ways and that's where the real element of faith comes in absolutely well put well put yeah yeah proverbs 3 5 and 6 you know it well trust in the lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight so um you know we try to understand the best that we can but when we still have questions we have to give it to god and say lord you know what you're doing, and so uh, we resign to you. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, this verse in chapter 2, verse 4, uh, is, is, is a very important verse throughout the whole book. In fact, if there was one verse that uh, uh, is kind of the hallmark verse, it is chapter 2, verse 4 which says, um, um, Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Uh, the righteous shall live by faith. That then is used um, a couple of times in Paul's writings. In Romans 1, 17, uh, it talks about how the just will live by faith. Uh, Galatians 3, 11, the same thing. And Hebrews 10, 38. And so the message from a New Testament perspective is, through faith in Jesus Christ, we receive... So here, here, here uh, the just shall live by faith. Major the major message in the book of Habakkuk, and it shows up three different times in the New Testament. It says here, through faith in Jesus Christ, we receive God's righteousness. The Holy Spirit enables us to live lives of faith and godliness. Habakkuk's statement lies at the heart of Christian theology. God calls us to sal salvation through faith and calls us to live every day by faith. So, Sometimes uh, outsiders, people that don't understand the Christian religion, Christian faith, they say, oh, Christianity is just a bunch of rules. And uh, that's not correct. That's a false understanding. That rather, Habakkuk 2 4 says, the just shall live by faith, that God calls us into a relationship with him and uh, that faith then does produce a uh, life uh, transformation. Uh, but, you know, God is the one that's all over that. God is the one that uh, instills that in us, brings that about in us. Uh, it's not as a result of just adherence to rules. Um, uh, the Ten Commandments, for instance, uh, I like how uh, one preacher put it. Um, uh, when God says don't, he also says, uh, don't hurt yourself. So we only disobey the Ten Commandments to our own demise and to our own hurt. Um, but there's no way that we could um, live up to a religion that said the only way that you can have a relationship with God is if you follow the rules. And it's based on how well you follow those rules that you can be in good standing with God. No, that's the very reason why Jesus came to this earth so long ago is that he, you know, God knew that we couldn't do it. And, um, and so we, 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 of course, we live out the Ten Commandments as a guide for our conscience, but we know that there have been many times that we have bore false witness, that we have um, lusted with our eyes, that we have um, taken something that didn't belong to us, or we have used God's name in a careless way, and the list could go on and on. 
That's why we need the perfect person, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to come and reign in our hearts and in our lives so that we can be changed people from the inside out. And so that's really the hallmark of uh, the Christian faith and why the Protestant Reformation came about. Um, whereas the Catholic Church in the 1500s was teaching a righteousness by works, uh, so Martin Luther and others who followed suit, Caspar Schwenkfeld being one of them, taught that no, the, the, the message of the Bible is that the just shall live by faith or the righteous shall live by faith. And so that became a hallmark of the, of the Reformation. Well, you've been uh, great to come and be a part of this. Any, any closing comments or questions? Uh, anything that strikes you uh, in the study of Habakkuk and uh, uh, any, any insight that you want to lend to the group? One thing uh, that I thought was interesting when you commented about uh, Saddam sort of like thinking that he was the uh, setting up the next Babylon, when you look at his rival during the period of time and before, the Shah of Iran envisioned him almost as another, uh, I forget whether it was Xerxes or uh, which of the uh, great ones from the Persian Empire. Oh. So you have the megalomaniac uh, nature of both. Oh. And of course, that's why we've got such a crazy time going on there because it's still a continuation of the thing. But uh, the Shah spent millions on trying to redo uh, the city of Persopolis to make it the new seat of the Persian Empire. Oh. So the more things uh, uh, change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. Same as far as it's folly. I guess so. I guess so. Can I, can I ask a question, David? Yeah. Uh, Ryan, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, great. So uh, this question goes to the, back to the beginning uh, of what you were defining like as a prophet, as someone who speaks the word of God, etc. cetera. Um, so my question is, related to this reference in the New Testament in 2 Peter 1, um, when they say, and I'll just read it here, it's, um, the, well, they're talking about how they're following Christ's word, and they say that, um, you know, they heard his voice, that we, we were with him on the holy mount. We, also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the dawn, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved of the Holy Ghost. So, my question is just on your thoughts of what they mean by my 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 understanding is that they're just talking about the Word of God in general when they say that we have a more sure word of prophecy meaning we have the written word now and that they, but I was just curious because of how they phrase it. They say uh, no prophecy of scripture is any, is of any private interpretation. So is, your, is that your understanding that the prophecy of scripture is just the written word or is that, is that, or is it something different like a certain, you know, um, something more than what's it like, is it, is it like, um, you know, a, prof, um, like you were saying in the beginning, some people think it's just predicting the future or things that will happen. So just, just on that phrase, the prophecy of scripture. Well, it's a great question, uh, Ryan. I think first, uh, uh, Peter is, is referencing the experience that he and the others had um, on the Mount of Transfiguration when, when Jesus was uh, shown in all of his glory, and Peter himself said, oh, I, I think we ought to build a tabernacle to you and Moses and Elijah. So that's what he's referring to in verses 17 and 18, uh, when, when God spoke and said, this is my beloved son uh, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And so uh, that's going back to to, to that. And, and Jesus is the fulfillment of scripture. And Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. 
Uh, and so when he says here, we have the prophetic word uh, more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Um, so, um, yes, I believe that scripture is the completion or the fulfillment uh, of, of prophecy and uh, uh, scripture itself is also prophetic. Um, it describes the future. There are things written in the book of Revelation that have yet to take place. And there are things in the book of Revelation that have taken place. And, um, and we could go back to uh, uh, Jesus's uh, Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. And he's describing things that took place uh, in the immediate future with uh, the defeat of Jerusalem, and he's describing also things that will take place uh, in the very last days. And I say the very last days because I think the last days are uh, anything from Jesus's ascension to the here and now. The last 2,000 years from a New Testament standpoint are known as the last days. Um, but um, this uh, verse 21, verses 20 and 21, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from one's, someone's own interpretation. Uh, he's right. That goes back to what was uh, I quoted from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, a prophet's message didn't come from himself. It came from God. And, um, just as Peter then says in verse 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was the one, was the originator of the message, and he gave the burning message to the heart of the, the true biblical prophet, whether it be Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Nahum, Zephaniah, and the list could go on and on. And they couldn't help but to communicate what God wanted them to communicate. But I, I do uh, agree with you that the Bible is the completed prophecy, uh, that the Bible is the completed source of prophecy, that there's a... Uh, uh, the, the, the word of God as we have it here today uh, is the standard and the message that, um, that God has given uh, to the people of the world uh, to listen to, to understand, to adhere to. I like what John MacArthur said, if you want to hear God uh, in an audible voice, uh, speak the Bible out loud. And uh, <laughs> I think that that's the truth. I think that... Uh, we would do well to study our Bibles more uh, than to pay attention to someone who claims to, to know the future. So, can I, can I ask a follow up on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, is there a difference then? So, uh, two, two things. I'll, I'll follow up on that and then I'll just attack on a question. Okay. Because I, I've heard that, um, you know, you could call prophecy, you know, the spoken word of God that said God spoke through a prophet. That's that, what they're referring to in the second verse. The holy men of God speak as they were moved. The prophecy came in, the prophecy came not in the old time, but, you know, they spoke the word of God. So it's like prophecy is the spoken word and then scripture is the written word. Um, that's just sort of how I kind of summarized it before. But um, I guess to go back, um, so, I mean, what's the difference then, is, if there is any, between the scripture and the prophecy of scripture? Because they're using that phrase, that no prophecy of the scripture. Is that something different than the scripture itself? I, I don't think so. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, you had... Um, those prophets that wrote down their messages. Um, so you, you read those messages in, for instance, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Nahum, Zephaniah, 
Zechariah, the list could go on and on. And then there were those prophets that you that you read the narrative of 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 what they did. Elijah and Elisha are are two examples. You you don't you don't read their messages, but you read what they did and how they interacted with the kings at the time. Um, and so um, two different kinds of prophets. Those uh, um, are more scribal and those that are more demonstrative. Um, but no, I, 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 don't, I don't think that there's a differentiation between Scripture and the prophecy of Scripture. Scripture contains prophecy, mm. um, but um, the Scripture is the Scripture. The Scripture is the written Word of God. Um, and it, it says all that we need to, to hear. Um, I had a, a professor once tell me, you know, there, there's nothing that tongues or prophecy, and he's speaking toward uh, the more sensational gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and other places. He said, there's nothing that they can tell me that the Bible has not already told me. Um, and, and that's true. That's true. Now, are there times that God wants those messages to proclaim, to be proclaimed, um, more clearly and more loudly? Yes. Uh, God raises up preachers. God raises up missionaries to go and, and, uh, and bear the message of, of Christ, uh, to, to congregations and, and people in foreign lands. Um, but um, no, I don't see a difference there. All right, thanks. Yeah, that's what I. That, that's kind of the conclusion that I came to. But I just wanted to kind of get get confirmation sure. on that. Yeah, so appreciate it's, it. It's a, it's a great question. Great question. And anybody else have any questions or anything to share? Not really a question, just an observation that so much was said in such a short book. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I wish I could do that. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I hope that each of you are doing well. I hope your you and your families are healthy. Uh, I hope that you are uh, continuing to live by the guidelines of uh, proper distancing and being conservative with your with your behavior. Uh, I. I think that uh, I, I'm, I am concerned about how this is going to play in the months ahead. Um, you know, my dad is 88 years old. He lives in Southwest Missouri and uh, he, he wants to go out and do for himself. And I said, dad, you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful. Um, and interaction with others. And, and yet I know that there are some States uh, in our country that, you know, are opening up and, and uh, I think Oklahoma is completely opened up, um, Georgia, um, maybe some other places, but uh, I just uh, encourage you to be careful. I, I think for us on the East Coast, it's a maybe a different scenario, but uh, these, are, these are challenging times, no doubt. Everyone's been compliant so far with, with these orders, and uh, you know we're supposed to comply with, with the, the authorities, right? Um, mm -hmm. Biblically speaking, but mm -hmm. not to the detriment, not to the detriment of the word of God, right? At some point. So, I mean, like you have to like be able to preach and you have to be able to do things like that. Right. So, I mean, like, it, it, is there anything that would indicate that like we should be, I mean, because you can't suppress the church forever. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. have you given that, has, has there been thought about, like, I don't know. It's just, it's just such a crazy time that like, Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, it's a good question, Ryan. I, I think that when, when one door, uh, not to, not to uh, use a cliche, but I guess I'm going to do it anyway. You know, when one door closes, another door opens and here, here's an example. Um, you know, I, I think that, we're living in very difficult times. Um, and 
one funeral, no, two funerals in Albany, Georgia. Maybe you ran across this story. Two funerals in Albany, Georgia. One was a, for a custodian in a, in a local school that he was well-loved and, and appreciated. And another young man that I think died in a motorcycle accident. Two funerals um, resulted in the death of nine people, six from one family. Um, and uh, one of the pastors to one of those funerals and a couple of others. And so, you know, th this is on the one hand, this is a life or death situation, especially in an area of the country where there's, you know, the, the population is more condensed. Um, here, here's something, you know, what, what we're doing today is an example of how the church is changing and morphing you know, six months ago, um, we, you know, were thinking, oh, we need to do more with video in our church. <laughs> now, this has completely shoved us in that direction, and we've, we've not been given a choice. Not, you know, but I mean, we, we've, we've jumped in full force. But maybe you remember the Tenebrae service. Tenebrae service here at Central, one of my favorite services, and I know that others say that too. If we, we, we average probably 100 people for that service. You know how many people viewed the Tenebrae service this year and participated in it? 600. So I, I guess my point is, you know, I think that God is using this new technology and uh, although we're not meeting in person together, um, God, God is, is using the present day situation um, to, to, you know, fashion new ways to minister to people. Um, yeah, so I agree. It's awesome. I, I, it's I'm really encouraged great. by that. But yeah, I, I, I miss the local gathering. I miss... Uh, you know, shaking your hands or hugging your necks. I, I miss praying with people. I, I, I will tell you from a minister's point of view, uh, I, I, preaching in front of a camera is just so different than looking out at faces uh, because it, then it, 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 it seems to um, encourage, you know, more communication. But when I stare at Jeff's camera, I'm, I'm, I'm more conscious of myself and the words that I'm producing rather than speaking to an individual. And that's been a challenge to get used to. Um, you, you would, uh, you know, when the three of us gather in that room, the three ministers, and uh, we go through our, we, Jeff could, could run a blooper reel, um, you know, uh, and it would be funny um, how, well, you know, we'll start off and we got to repeat something, you know, or we got to, or we get, we get our uh, words mixed up, uh, or as my mom used to say, get my merds wixed. So, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, I think God's at work and, um, I, 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 I'm not, you know, one like, um, other ministers in other parts of the country, very few, thankfully that say, Oh, the church has got to meet together, you know, to heck with this, uh, you know, containment order. The church has got to meet together. I, I'm, I'm not there. I, uh, I, I want uh, because you know our church is, has so many older individuals, and uh, uh, I just don't want people to to their lives to be in jeopardy. Um, but I do think that God is using the present day technology to accomplish His purposes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think so too. It's I've had tons of engagement on on Zoom with people and doing our prayer meeting, by the men's study on Saturdays, and a couple of meetings during the week, and now this one for the first time has been great. So, I mean, I don't see a reason why you can't you know spread the word to, through this through these conferences and, and and get even more people on there. And people seem really open to it now. Um, as far as people that I've talked to that have been there, everyone's look, everyone's, everyone knows, everyone knows, everyone's looking for some kind of connection and with God and, 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 and everything. And it's just, I mean, it's a terrible time for in, in certain ways, but it's a great time for, for other things. So just yeah. um, want to encourage you that we, we appreciate everything that you do here. I know Stephanie Thank does you. too, and watching the videos and, and uh, we, you know, you think you're doing a good job. And, thank um, you. 
Thank you. I wish, I wish that Jeff could take about 30 pounds off of my frame and maybe give me a nice full head of hair, but he's, he's, he's a novice at this himself. So. Uh, Post-production. <laughs> Post-production. <laughs> okay. Things, Any, anybody else things, have anything to say? One of the things I was going to mention on there is like, and it's also a cliche, but what you see highlighted, and this relates to what uh, you were saying, David, as well, that the church is not a building, which is what too many people uh, believe. And yet when you look at it, we are the church right now, and it's being in the body of Christ. And by these meetings in Zoom, in some ways, you can almost look at this as a modern update of the house churches, the people getting together in the early days of Christianity, where once they were kicked out of the synagogues, they had to get together however they could. Well, and today, that's sort of what we're doing. We're getting together however we could. Yeah. E excellent insight. Yeah, you're right. I, I didn't think about that. that that's good. Yeah. God uses adversity. We, we hate it. We, we shy away from it. We don't want it. We wouldn't ask for it, but God brings it about um, to grow us and to, to, to develop uh, and, and to, yeah. Well, why don't I close us with prayer? I hope you guys have a great day. Uh, it's a beautiful day. I guess the rain's coming, but um, Hope you're able to uh, go uh, and know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Let, let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have had together. And uh, I thank you for each person here. I pray, God, that you would remind us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Uh, I pray for health and safety for all of us. I pray for those who are suffering uh, with the virus or have lost loved ones. And we pray, God, that you would uh, minister to them and help them at this time. And Lord, use this time of adversity to draw many unto yourself. Thank you for uh, the time in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dave. Bye. Good to see Have everybody. Take see care. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. My pleasure.